There are many factors that influence what degree of success or failure animals find when they are introduced to chimere. Sometimes an animal is quite successful in their endemic ecosystem, but due to competition, climate, or other factors, simply don't establish themselves in this new world. Other times they might be specialized in a minor niche on Earth, and then thrive in chimere due to that niche not being occupied by substantial competition. Sometimes success or failure simply comes down to luck. There is perhaps no better exemplars of luck favoring a clade than the sloth. The portal to South America harvested in the late Miocene, around 6 million years ago. This was just as the known world was recovering from a moderate extinction event of wetland specialists brought on by an arid period. Now wetlands were widespread, the inland sea was formed by converging continents and became a verdant seagrass meadow, and the climate was coincidentally almost identical to that of South America during this period. The context was perfect for a great sloth invasion. Others and arthrans, such as armadillos and anteaters, and other South American fauna such as ungulates, terror birds, and monkeys came to Chimere and flourished in the known world. Marine life, such as macroraptorial sperm whales and pinnipeds, found similar success in Chimere. Sloths, however, were the breakout stars of this harvest. Not only did they occupy the arboreal, fossorial, terrestrial, and marine clades as they did on Earth, several new clades evolved. Sloths today are known from only two families of arboreal herbivores, the two- and three-toed sloths. Although they look quite similar, they independently became small climbers from different terrestrial families, and their last common ancestor lived between 30 and 35 million years ago. The clade Megatherioidea, which is now represented by the three-toed sloth and prehistorically included multi-ton giants like Megatherium and semi-aquatic sloths like Thalassocnus. The clade of two-toed sloths, Mylodontoidea, produced such diggers as Lestodon and Mylodon, a famous genus which was studied by such giants in the natural science field as Charles Darwin and Sir Richard Owen. Going forward, I will mention the major groups of chimerian sloths in the context of these two groups, the two- and three-toed clades, but keep in mind that these two living groups are highly specialized from very different ancestors, most of which actually had four or five fingers. This designation may be a bit confusing in this light, but I've decided to break them down by what group they are related to instead of by ground or aquatic sloths, since cladistics is more important than morphology, and frankly I find it really interesting that the distinct lineages independently evolved many similar representatives. In Chimere, there are small tree sloths in both two- and three-toed clades. Like their earthly kin, both are slow, tranquil animals. The two-toed sloths are generally more diverse and successful and have a clade represented by several species that are surprisingly agile and active. This group is extinct on Earth, but in Chimere, compete with monkeys and lesser apes in the canopy. The Urutumotu of Picardia is by far the largest member of this group, being around the size of a person and enjoying near-exclusive access to the nuts and berries of Picardian conifers much higher than similarly sized climbers can reach. The Goo, also of Picardia, is around the same size as many two-toed sloth relatives on Earth, and are fairly intelligent, being kept as pets by many Picardians. For a time, the titanic sloths of the three-toed clade were among the largest mammals of the known world. However, the diggers of the two-toed clade grew much larger over time than they did on Earth, eventually supplanting the three-toed giants due to better defenses, a more varied diet, and longer and better parental care. The Hukulgore is, at 6 to 10 tons, by far the largest of the sloths and one of the largest mammals of Chimere. They are protected by osteoderms beneath very thick hide and armed with mitten-like hands ending in claws that can grow nearly a meter long. These adaptations protect them well from attacks by the Zentar, their only natural predator. When ambushed, they can be killed by the Zentar, 
although if they see the attack coming, adults can often fend off these Megaraptorans. Their intertwining tunnels are massive, sometimes half a mile long, and often contain many generations of related animals in their own branches. There are several smaller armored burrowers, found on both continents and many islands of the known world. One species, the Wojun, is a highly proficient climber as well as a burrower. These widespread sloths make their dens out of caves, often living hundreds of feet beyond the reach of predators, climbing a long way down to forage. Like all sloths, they are comfortable swimmers, and are known to populate islands, sometimes being the only terrestrial megafauna on tall island habitats. The Wojun of the Housie Prairie are by far the most carnivorous sloths, with carrion and slow game making as much as 90% of their diet during the dry season. Two-toed sloths today have long been associated with omnivory, taking eggs and small animals to supplement their herbivorous diet, while their three-toed cousins are much stricter herbivores. Recent studies show that Mylodon, a prehistoric member of the two-toed clade, was a regular consumer of meat, while a member of the three-toed clade in the same study came up a strict herbivore. This distinction is found in Chimere too. Member of the three-toed sloth clade are all herbivores, while members of the two-toed clade often scavenge, or in rare cases, hunt slow prey. With as many verdant wetland and marine habitats as there are in the known world, it should come as no surprise that around half of the sloth species found in Chimere are aquatic. There are two clades descended from Thallus ochnus, a marine sloth of the three-toed clade. They can generally be broken down into swimmers and bottom punters. The swimmers live much like a manatee, feeding on seagrass in the vast inland sea. They are very buoyant, using their claws to secure themselves to the sea floor as they feed. The bottom punters are negatively buoyant, sinking to the bottom, which does mean they cannot swim, but they can effortlessly sit on the bottom of shallow water and feed for up to an hour before needing to crawl back to the shore to breathe. Both strategies are quite successful, and each genus has several species in the inland sea and wetland habitats of the known world. The inland sea is indeed so inundated with marine sloths, which enjoy such dominion of the seagrass meadows, only competing with a few species of Cyrenian and one species of Dicynodont, that it is often called the Great Sloth Sea. With as much bounty as can be found in the wetlands, the two-toed sloths produce their own semi-aquatic members. This clade was more specialized for freshwater wetlands, and was hit hard by competition with hippos when they arrived half a million years ago. The four-ton Sakur, largest and last of this group in the known world, holds their own, living much like a moose but in a more tropical setting, thriving in wetlands and hopping between lush island habitats. Future videos will go into more detail of each animal and clade, but I hope that this overview demonstrates the diversity and success that sloths have found in Chimere, and underscores that luck is often the deciding factor in who lives and who dies in this volatile world.